Well, yeah, thank you everyone for uh, tuning into this talk. Um, so it's nothing too crazy. Uh, so some of you may know from seeing the email thread, um, today's age, S talk is meant to be done in person at the mechanic school, but uh, unfortunately due to um, some issues with the booking and the site, we've now decided to put it online. Um, so being the January talk, um, it's generally not a high turnout one because everyone's settling back into work. I know I myself am settling back into work. Um, so it's generally something that's either a little live or we usually have trivia. Um, but this year I was chatting with Chris, the society president, and he asked me um, to just do a little sort of travelogue Herc trip um, presentation um, of a, a trip I did late last year to Narrabri. Um, so, and the surrounds, um, just because it's such a great little herping location, heaps of interesting little species you can see, and big species for that matter. Um, so I thought I'd just take you guys on a bit of a, a bit of a trip and cover a few of the species that we saw. So um, the first one you can see here on the op opening slide is a uh, Jackie Dragon, good old Amphibularis muricatus. Um, I'm not quite fond of these guys and dealt with them quite a lot through various capacities. So I thought it would make a nice little um, starting slide. Um, and so this fella here was on the top of Mount Caputa, uh, but I'll get to that in a bit. So yeah, just to start things off, um, we're all Sydney siders, so we live in Sydney, um, and we decided to take the six hour or so drive out to Narrabri over the October long weekend um, to get a number of target species that most of us hadn't seen. Um, we also had another mate who joined us from uh, Queensland who came down. Um, and so it was just a nice sort of uh, catch up trip for us and, and a weekend away. Um, and we got to see quite a few herbs. So we did have a few targets, as I said. Probably the biggest one was to see a Gurnia rumai, the Mount Capital skink. Um, but we also had a few others like the V banded snakes, uh, pale heads, hopefully guitardus. So yeah, um, and a few other frogs and things as well. So for those who don't know, Narrabri is in the Northwestern Slopes. It's a pretty nice location um, for herps. There's a huge diversity of uh, reptiles and particularly snakes as well as frogs uh, in the region. Um, it's kind of this beautiful little meshing point where this sort of southern Brigolo bioregion starts. So you get whole bunch of stuff you don't really see on other parts of the coast or that close to the coast, I should say. So yeah, it starts bringing in quite a few interesting species. Um, as one of the guys I went with um, described it in his mind, it's kind of west enough that you don't have to drive ages, but also west enough that you start getting new and interesting things. Um, so the first place we stopped uh, and the first herp of the trip is actually an Agonia striolata, so a tree skink. Um, and we found this guy just basking on a little uh, fence post as we stopped for a pea break in Musselbrook. Um, so we decided to pull over in Musselbrook because we were thinking of trying to have a squiz for some um, Lyophilus modesta, the Eastern Range Rock Skinks, because there's a fairly well-known population there. Um, and we were given a spot by a friend to go check him out. And when we got there, it wasn't quite as great as we thought it would be. Um, and it was also, um, pardon me, um, pretty time consuming. So we decided we just have a quick pee and jump on the road. Um, but in driving out there, we did, yeah, get this little fella on a, on a fence post, which is always fun. With quite a charismatic little skink. And it definitely wasn't the last one of the trip. There's plenty more to come. Um, so after our little pee break, got back on the road and came across this absolute beauty of a brown, unfortunately, that being clipped by a car somewhere near, oh geez, um, Kalewis. Um, just outside the township of Kerr Lewis. Um, and so, yeah, it was uh, pretty unfortunate because it's a nice looking specimen. It was nice and chunky, um, good size to it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it just wasn't for us, this fella, or lady for that matter. Um, so yeah, a bit of a sad start to the trip there, but we kept on going along. Finally got to Narrabri, we settled in. Um, go into our accommodation and then decided to go have a squiz around just outside of town at a pretty well-known area. Um, and while we're having a look around, you know, sort of sussing out um, different sort of branches and trees and all that sort of stuff. And the first herp of the trip, as you may suspect, um, it's pretty common as out there, but it's uh, the first herp, I should say, narrow one, the first herp of the trip uh, was the ever wonderful uh, binose gecko. Um, and so we found one of these guys. This isn't the same one. This is one of the millions that we did find as well. Um, but the first one we did find was sort of wedged in an old cut down tree, uh, just sort of sitting in the top of um, one of those sort of old forestry cut down trees. 
Um, so yeah, that was a, a fun little start, the first first herp of Narrowbrow, which was cool. Um, it was just starting to get dark when we found that guy, so we were hoping that was a sign of a good night, but he was already starting to come out on twilight. And we ended up going down to a bit more of a, a wetter area with um, where we know there was a lot of frog activity. Um, so I'd previously been out there before and sussed out a few areas where there's heaps of frogs and we were hoping to get those wonderful frog-eating snakes. Um, and so we weren't disappointed. We ended up getting out there and we, we got a few frogs. So it's a little Euparolia, um, among a number of other things. So we've got a few Latoria Lata Palmata as well, which are the broad palmed rocket frogs. Um, so they were nice to, to get as well. Um, but you know, the main end of the um, salmon eye as well, the Nodonasty salmon eye, so the salmon striped frog, which um, I've got one a little later. We didn't, I didn't get any photos of the, the young one we found uh, this time, but I do have at the end a photo of a, a nice big adult I found when I was out there not too long before that. Um, but the first target we eventually got, and he was sort of hanging around in that flooded area, probably eating all those frogs, that was the Davies banded snake, or the Denisonia Davii. Um, so I've, I personally always really like these guys. I think they're really nifty looking snakes. Um, I'd seen captive specimens before, but this is actually my first wild one to see. Um, so yeah, it was really cool being able to actually um, find one of these guys out in the bush um, and get some photos of it and just get to sort of, you know, experience them really um, in the wild. And like most things, you always have these grand theories about the habitat they live in and nine times out of ten it's just for these things at least and especially where people turn them up the most pretty highly degraded rubbish habitat and that's what it was it was a puddle on the side of the road um <laughs> unfortunately he was in a good state that at the v's um but the other snakes that we came across quite a lot that evening were red nape snakes and they're just everywhere out there so um we were just west of narrabri about about 30 k's out of narrabri um and these guys littered the roads. They're just absolutely cruel. And we came across probably half a dozen this night and plenty more the night after. Um, this one, unfortunately, had been hit by a car and, you know, wasn't in a good state at all, as you can see. Um, it definitely wasn't the, the only roadkill thing there. It's really sad to say, but there was um, this particular road we hit most nights, um, just even if it was a quick one. We're only there for a couple of nights, but we hit it each night. Um, and just the, the change in the number of species that were there and the abundance. So the first night was mainly these guys and uh, Strophurus geckos. We were just all over the road. Um, the next night, all it was was green, uh, green tree frogs. Just, you know, you couldn't drive 20 metres without seeing a green tree frog just sitting on the road. Um, and then the third night, it was just sort of a mishmash. And we got a few more snakes on that night too, but we'll come to that. But yeah, it just shows you it's all about timing and whatever's going on really. Oh, and tessellated geckos, plenty of tessellated geckos on that third night as well. Um, but yeah, same piece of road, same sort of conditions, just different species out each night. Um, after the uh, the red nape there, we did come across uh, another one of our target species. So I've had the pleasure of seeing these guys before, but it doesn't change how impressive they are. They're always something that's really, really fun to see. Um, for those that aren't aware, it is a, a holy cross frog or a holy cross toad. Um, which is noted in Benedi. Um, so these guys are really probably, to my mind, probably one of, if not the most attractive frog species in Australia. You know, you could argue things like Karabru frogs or the other noted and are also quite attractive, but these guys are just quite striking and there's a, a beautiful variation in pattern. Um, and they're also just quite cute. Like their the whole body and morphology is just round and rotund and watching them hop is quite entertaining because it's not quite like a, uh, another frog hop where they've got that kind of explosive bound up and they, you know, some things can reach crazy heights and just move big distances. Notodons kind of do like this barrel, barreling sort of scurry bounce, um, which probably isn't a great description of their locomotion, but uh, <laughs> it's it's very different to a whole bunch of other frogs, but it's, it was a true pleasure being able to see these guys again. Um, and not that we, we got a photo of it, but we did, were able to sort of get near one that was calling. Uh, which is really cool because these guys have such a like ethereal sort of ghostly call. It's like oh, woo, woo. oh no, it's not a, not a great way of doing it, but like it's a it's a whooping noise. Um, so it's quite quite entertaining hearing these guys go crazy. Um, so this is just a different angle of the same Notodon. Um, so you know this guy was quite a friendly little specimen just sitting out on the road. But you know if you walk any of the road verges or walk near ponds or even the farmland, as we're driving down um, the road out there, you could hear 
not this time, but a previous time, you can hear them calling in all the farms along the main side of the road when it's flooded. Um, so they're quite a common species there after a bit of rain. Um, the other cool thing about these guys um, is that, you know, they do extrude like a gluey goo sort of thing um, when they get stressed. So it's, it's kind of interesting little uh, any predator behavior that they've got. The all around just makes them one of those really, really charismatic little frogs. Um, it really deserves, you know, all the praise in the world. Um, not to say that other frogs aren't charismatic, obviously. Um, so yeah, as we're continuing on with the night, um, we came across uh, plenty of Strophurus. Uh, these guys were out in droves. Um, probably the most common animal of the trip, I would say. Uh, or the most common reptile, at least. Um, much like I was saying with the green tree frogs tonight, these guys were out in force. You couldn't drive 20, 30 metres without seeing at least two or three Strophurus on the road. And you had to desperately try and avoid hitting them because um, they are quite small and quite hard to pick up. So you really do hope that you don't clip any. Um, and the road we were on wasn't a, a quieter road. It was it was quietish, but you know there's still plenty of traffic on it um, as it was sort of heading to a main sort of area. Um, so yeah, but these guys are just wonderful to see. Um, such a charismatic little little animal. And same sort of thing. If you ever want to practice your photography skills, Strafur is definitely the the species to um, try it on because they are pretty com complicit with you know sitting there and just looking photogenic like this guy is here. Um, so yeah, and I should say this uh, species is Strophurus williamsi, uh, so the eastern spangtail gecko. Um, a bit further south, you do start getting intermediates too, but where we were, I, it's pretty much just williamsi. Um, but yeah, they're quite, quite a lovely looking little gecko. Um, unfortunately, as I sort of alluded to earlier, um, not all of them made it. We did stop for this guy and find one that had unfortunately been clipped by a car. Um, hopefully not our car, I'm pretty sure it wasn't because it wasn't really off the side of the road where we were, but um, you never know. So yeah, unfortunately this guy had been splattered pretty badly. Um, and yeah, it's one of the sad things like, you know, whenever you go out herping, there's actually a surprisingly large amount of animals, obviously because they are attracted to the road. There is a surprisingly large amount of things that do get clipped just every night. Um, so yeah, I felt pretty bad for this fella. But with that, that pretty much wrapped up this night. We didn't want to have too too long a night just because we did have plans for the next morning. It was supposed to be a pretty hot day, so we wanted to get on the road fairly early um, to head out to where we we're going to do some day herping. Um, so yeah, we, we wrapped it up and, and went home from there. Um, so the next day, we were on the way to Mount Kaputa. Um So Mount Kaputa is this beautiful, um, I guess, sky mountain type thing. I don't know how to describe it, but at the top of the mountain, it's just such a different environment to what it is at the base of the mountain and the surrounding environment. Um, so as we drove in, we had the pleasure of seeing quite a few Eastern bearded dragons all around the base of the mountain, quite a common sort of species in that greater region. Um, and yeah, they're always pretty charismatic. This guy wasn't the best looking one we saw. We saw a like, phenomenally yellow one um, a bit further on, but unfortunately within, you know, being in its presence for like a minute, it had just dulled itself down to grey before anyone could get a good photo. It's quite crazy how rapidly these guys can change their colour. Um, so the next species we came across, which we were excited about, was uh, Lyophilus podesta. So this was the species we were looking for out in um, uh, Musselbrook when we stopped there for a brief brief pee break, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but we had the, the pleasure of finding these guys just alongside um, the track up to um, the top of Mount Caputa. Um, so I've actually kept these guys as a, a captive species for quite a few years and really enjoyed them. Um, and this is the first time I'd ever seen them in the wild, so I was pretty stoked to see them. Um, and yeah, they're just they're just a wonderful little lyophilus. Um, and so yeah, these guys were at the base of the mountain. And what's really cool is at the top of the mountain you get white skinks, and that's probably because it is a much cooler environment and more conducive to them. And the same thing as well, the Jackie that I showed a photo of earlier. Jackies were present at the top of the mountain while at the bottom of the mountain we were finding Burns dragons as well, which are their more Arab counterparts. So it really does have that cool little elevational gradient, I guess, in species composition. Um, quite common all around the base of the mountain were knobby dragons. Um, so they were, I mean, anyone that's been out that way can tell you that knobby dragons are probably the rat lizards of the region. Um, they're just so abundant in any part of woodland, you know, any anywhere really. But there's suitable habitat for them. You're going to find at least 6,000. 
Um, and yeah, there's this beautiful gravid female just sitting out, roasting herself away, um, getting all crispy um, in the sun and hopefully going to drop some eggs in the very near future. Um, along with that, we saw quite a few juveniles and like lovely males that color up really nicely. So the males become quite attractive um, when they're in breeding colors with like, you know, yellow flushes out there and pink flushes as well. So that was quite cool. Um, and then, yeah, the Jackie that I mentioned. So we ended up going up to a lookout and just decided to have a squeeze and have a look around at the view. And um, as some of you may know, Mount Kapitar actually had a pretty severe fire there during the um, black summer bushfires. So a fair amount of the area got cooked. Um, and so we just sort of got to this lookout to have a squeeze around. It wasn't one of the main lookouts. It was a sort of side one, I believe. Um, but it was probably one of the coolest spots for finding herbs. We spent a good probably 30, 30, 40 minutes there just photographing the Jackie dragons, Cunningham skinks, white skinks, just watching them do the things they did. Like this Jackie was basking right near a white skink um, and there were half a dozen Cunninghams all basking around just doing their thing as well. So it's quite fun just sitting around watching these guys and enjoying them um, do what they do in nature. Um, so there's one of the white skinks I mentioned and you know, much darker than a lot of the ones I've previously seen. And quite a few of the ones up there were quite, oops, uh, one wrong there, sorry. Oh no, running it. Um, these guys were quite, quite a bit darker than a lot of the other ones I have seen previously. So um, yeah, it was just a nice bit of diversity and it's always interesting seeing a species in the new spot as well. Uh, I apologize for how greedy this photo is. It's not the best one. I should say I'm not an amazing photographer. I just like taking photos of things you know, for my own sort of interest, I guess. Um, but yeah, this is a Cunningham skink. And most of the ones up there are quite a, quite attractive, quite pretty looking animals. Um, really, really common. They're just every rock pile, you've got probably like a thousand Cunningham skinks. Um, so that's really nice being able to see them in such high numbers and densities, especially after the fires. If there's anything I can feel short about having been to quite a few areas um, that have been hit by the fires of the Black Summer sort of event, um, particularly rock dwelling species, just don't seem to have been affected at all. There's just millions of them. If it's some sort of rock specialist or rock outcrop, um, more than likely they've just dived into the, the rock crevice and, you know, waited it out until they've got away from all that heat. Um, and then, you know, being reptiles, they've probably got the, you know, ability with their metabolism to sort of wait out until food starts picking up again. So this is a photo of us all hanging around at this outlook, trying to photograph things. I should say to go with uh, yeah, several of my mates, so Marcus Healy and um, John Stevens and Luke Youngins as well. And I've got some photos from each of them as well that I'll be sharing because particularly Luke is a much better photographer than I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just a photo of the landscape as well. So you can see some of the beautiful areas up there. So the next species we came across, which is a fairly common one for Sydney side is if you look in the right spots, um, but still charismatic and beautiful nevertheless, was the red-throated skink. So this photo is one of Luke's photos. Uh, so we found quite a few red throated skinks throughout the trip and they're, they're quite common in the right places at Caputa uh, and the Warren Bungles. Um, and yeah, they're just, you know, as the name would suggest, they've got the beautiful red throat. Um, they really are just, uh, again, a, a charismatic little animal. Um, so it's quite cool seeing these guys up there as well. Um, and this is just a, yeah, a photo from Luke showing that nice sort of bright red breeding throat. Uh, another species we did come across, um, and this is a photo from me, so appreciate how bad it is, um, was a Hemiogus. So this is Hemiogus telebingoensis, I think it's pronounced. I'm, I'm not particularly great with Hemiogus, but um, yeah, so found this fella. He's quite cool. They're a nice little sort of fossorial lizard. Um, so yeah, it was nice seeing him and um, just experiencing, I guess, another species as well on the trip. Um, but all of this was on our way to finding one of those target species I mentioned, uh, which was the Caputa Mountain or Caputa Mountain or Caputa Rock Skink. Um, so Agonia Rumai. So for those who don't know, this is the Governor, which is a, a big um, outlook rock sort of thing at um, Mount Caputa. And so we were sort of walking the trail along here, hoping to see see the Rumai. And yeah, it's just a beautiful landscape in general. Um, it is hell on earth when it's a hot day, like it's just a moonscape of heat and reflection and sunburn. Um, but it's, the, the skinks in particular seem to love the absolutely crazy hot days. That's when we've got the most activity. Well, that's when we saw them the most was when it was absolutely scalding hot. 
So that quite on the governor, or at least not the ones we saw, but you do have to look around a bit and you'll eventually find them. Just a few more landscape shots here. Uh, the other thing we were hoping to see, but it probably wasn't the greatest um, conditions for them, was the Mount Caputo giant pink slug. So definitely have a Google of these to get some photos of them, but they're really impressive. Like I think about 20 centimeters or so long, giant hot pink slug that comes out after rain. Um, so they were, they're quite cool. Uh, but we sort of kept heading along the trail with the hope that we might see one of these guys, not that we might, not that we did, I should say. Um, plenty more red-throated skinks. This is just an in-situ red throat skink. Um, so we spent probably 40 minutes walking around, having a look at rock piles, just trying to find um, the Capito rock skinks. And yeah, there was a few things that we sort of shot off and I was like, oh, maybe that's one of them, it looks like it. And anyway, lo and behold, we eventually did get one. So this is Agurnia rumai, um, the Mount Capito rock skink. So they're originally considered part of the um, Saxatilis group, so the black rock skink group. Um, though I think it's been known for like 20 years or something that they were their own independent species, but they only got formally described in the past, I think, two years or so. Um, so yeah, and they were a species that was thought to be um, initially threatened by the fires, um, just because they are restricted to that mountain peak in Mount Capita. Um, they're only at really high elevations, and a lot of that area was cooked. It was pretty roasted. Thankfully, not on the actual um, sort of uh, rocky, escarpment -y, cliffy area itself, um, probably because there wasn't a great amount of um, stuff that was flammable there. There definitely was some, but not tons. But all the surrounding forest was pretty burnt. Um, but as I said, all of these rock-dwelling guys seem to have waited it out. So this was a, a female, um, or we're pretty confident it was a female, and she had uh, fresh mating marks on her shoulder, not that you can see it in this photo. So she had these clear sort of um, bite marks that looked like they were some sort of uh, mating scar from a, a male, and she was quite rotund as well. So whether she was ovulating at that time, which was sort of October or what was going on, I don't quite know, but still cool to see it. Um, and then with her, that sort of spent, spelt the influx of millions of Capita rock skinks. So eventually once we came across one, um, it probably was just the time of day sort of thing, but once we came across one, we started coming across squillions of them. Um, and then we went back to places we'd already looked at and found them there as well. And just, they are very abundant up there in, in quite high densities across the rock faces in the right areas. Uh, so this was just, uh, a nice sort of distance in situ, one of a, an animal I saw about 15 metres away, I'd say, 10 metres away, something like that. So I just sort of sat there and watched it bask and sort of scurry around and got a few photos of it. Um, so it was quite cool just watching them do their own thing. Um, rock skinks are really fun to just watch as they're doing stuff, I think. So I, I find that quite interesting. Um, here's a photo of an absolute goober posing across a burnt landscape. Um, so this was the only photo we actually had of a... Um, pretty pretty sort of crispy and you can see a lot of the um foliage there's just burnt off the trees and um quite quite crisp so the landscape overall was quite burnt up um thankfully as i said though there's still quite a lot of life there um but yeah so after that we um had a nice full day out at capita went back into town had sort of a cruisy afternoon and then went out on another round of uh night herping hoping to try and get some more animals um, and lo and behold, we got millions and millions of Strophurus again. Um, so it's still quite common. Uh, this is a photo by my friend Luke. It's, it's I think, a, a bit better than mine of a, a male Strophurus Williams eye. Um, just doing its thing and looking quite, quite impressive. Um, and we were also now, so we'd only seen, I think, on the previous night, one green tree frog. Um, and this night there were millions of them out. Um, and so we, um, yeah, ended up seeing quite a few of them. This was another one that Luke uh, got a photo of that looked quite good. Um, so instead of the spot we were sort of working at, we decided to go a bit further around and ended up going at the Barham Junction. Um, so a, a friend of one of the guys on the trip had given us, or said that many years ago, he'd seen quite a few Delma and Pygopus out there. And we were hoping to try and get some Delma and Pygopus, uh, as well as a few other things. So it's a bit further west than Arabra. It's kind of the next sort of, reasonable township before you hit Walgut. Um, so we went out there and had a squiz around and found absolutely nothing. Not because I don't think it was a good spot, just because I think that the, the night itself wasn't particularly great as we went all around the shop and didn't really find anything. 
Um, so we went from Barron Junction down to the actual township of Pilliga. I drove around a bit there. Um, we found a few things, which I'll get to in a sec, uh, but not, not anything too crazy. The main thing that was out that night was tessellated geckos. They were everywhere. Um, and then we also, not that they're easy to get photos of, but we actually did see quite a few small mammals, whether they were Bernard's plant girls, any kind of, I'm not 100% sure, even house mice. But it was just crazy watching all these small mammals just shoot across the road at the rate of knots. Um, so there's quite a few of those guys out and about. But one species we did keep turning up time after time was the ever wonderful red nape snake. Um, so these guys just are common as out there. Um, so we found a few of those and because we weren't getting too much else, um, Luke posed one up and all Luke found one and got quite a few good photos of it. Um, so yeah, it's a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful species to be honest. I guess it's just one of those things that when you've seen quite a few of them, you get a bit over it, but they are quite an attractive little lapid. Um, but as I said, it was a pretty dead night. Uh, the moon was quite high and it got to the point where we just found absolutely nothing after a couple of hours. So went back in to have a, an earlier night. Um, that way we were prepared for the next day. And so for the next day, we went to the Warren Bungles. Um, and if you haven't been to the Warren Bungles, would absolutely recommend it. It's a wonderful part of the world. The landscapes are beautiful. Um, the herpet fauna is really cool. It's just, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, so we did a few just bushwalks, like, you know, having a look around, but not really focusing on the reptiles. Um, and we definitely came across plenty of white skinks. There are a dime a dozen there. Um, but we ended up going to um, look for one of the species that we were trying to target, which was the black rock skink or the brown rock skink is the um, common name of the uh, Warren Buggles subspecies. So for those that aren't aware, um, the black rock skink itself, uh, Agonia saxatilis intermedia, um, the main species or the main population, I should say, it's kind of all down the east coast from sort of um, the Blue Mountains down the south coast and all the way into Vic and around that way. Um, and then there's this weird disjunct population at the Warren Bungles um, where the skinks themselves are a lot browner rather than black. And I think there's a few slightly different morphological um, differences with them as compared to primarily Sydney ones. I think it's a bit wacky with some Victorian ones, but I'm not super across it to be honest. But anyway, we, we went to a spot that's well known for them in the Warren Bungles and they're quite easy to see on one of the main tourist trails. Um, and the mistake of going on a main tourist trail on a long weekend was there's, there's 85,000 people and there was no parking. Um, so we desperately decided to go looking around at uh, more sort of quiet um, lookouts and trails to see if we could find one. We went to one of the side lookouts and it was one of those classic instances of there was probably about 20 people there and they were all looking around and looking at rocks and just enjoying the thing and they couldn't see the, the skinks directly under their feet um, and so just on the edge of the lookout there was a, a small family group of these guys these are just the what i assume would be probably yearlings um so the parents were much 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 more nervous and wouldn't come out of the rock if you looked at them they'd shoot straight back into rock crag while, um, yeah, these guys would just sort of sit out and bask and were quite outgoing and really fun to sort of experience and see. Um, so, yeah, we sort of sat there for a good 40 minutes just watching these guys come out, bask, scurry around, do what they do. Uh, so that first photo was one from myself, um, and then this one here is one from Luke, um, just showing that much more brown body coloration overall. If anyone that's seen um, the East Coast Saxatillus, they're pretty much black or mottled grey black used to colour, so very, very different overall. Um, and so, yeah, they, they were a really fun experience to see and enjoy. Um, and then right next to them was, not that you can see in this photo, but it's kind of just in there. Oops, sorry, just in, where's my cursor? There we go. Just in there. Um, was a little striolata, so another tree skink. And these guys were somewhat common in the area. Um, but yeah, they're just, as you could imagine, the second that he saw us, he dived straight into that log. Um, and, you know, being responsible, obviously, we weren't going to go harass the poor thing out of the log, so we just let him be um, and waited for him to hopefully come out. And he came out a bit more and then decided to go back in and refused to come out again. Um, and so with that, we, we sort of decided to wrap it up. We saw plenty of um, uh, plenty of nobbies there too. So if you want to see nobby dragons, Warren Bungles National Park, they're everywhere. Um, so yeah, it was it's quite cool. There was a species we did want to see here, which we didn't end up getting just because we were kind of time limited. Um, but it's quite common in the Warren Bungles and the Pilliga and 
it's a nighttime space, and that was uh, Oedura Elegans, which is a recent split from Oedura Monolos. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, we didn't get a chance to see those guys. But there's always next time. So after we wrapped up at the Warren Bungles, we went and had a, a pub lunch uh, in Kinabarabran. Um, and then we went for a sort of afternoon trip out to um, a place called the Pilliga Pottery, which is just along the side of the Pilliga when you go through the, I can't remember the name of the highway, the highway that connects Kinabarabran and um, Narrabri. Um, and so this is just a photo from a previous trip I did out at the Pilliga Pottery. So I went there with uh, my partner and we sort of had a farm stay for a couple of days out there. Um, and yeah, it's it's a beautiful place. If you're ever going just for like a touristy thing or the herb related thing, absolutely worth checking out, spending a night. They're lovely people. Um, the farm property is huge and they just let you experience it and walk around. It's There's only a small component for the size of the property. There's a small component that's farmland and the rest of it's just sort of wilderness. Um, and they were pretty happy with me when I just said, hey, do you mind if I just go for a walk around and I'm looking for reptiles and just curious about it all? They didn't mind at all. Um, and so, yeah, it was quite quite a fun experience. Um, but we ended up going out here because the um, this time, um, because while I was out there, I'd found quite a few or seen quite a few um, Tinoes robustus. And the robustus out in the Pilgrim are just beautiful. They're like bright red and nothing like the East Coast ones. I, the first time I saw them, I was literally like, oh, wow, is there different species of Tinoes? And then reasons it out that it was just a really pretty looking robustus. So um, some of the guys I'm with, uh, really big skinker files and they really wanted to see these these bright red uh, robustus so we went out to go try and see them as well um, but unfortunately again same issue being a long weekend uh, it was swarming with people there would have been probably about 30 cars there and they had a little cafe that was just pumping but um it would recommend so you know you can do all the farmyard stuff you want um and they're, they're really it's a really good environment there and there's plenty of pottery so if you're into pottery wonderful place to go. But the thing that makes the property, and this is a, a controversial thing for herpers, um, is the birds there. And by birds, I mean one species of birds. And by one species of bird, I mean one group of one species of bird that live there. So those of you that have not experienced apostle birds, haven't lived, um, they're probably one of the greatest things to have ever evolved. Um, they're just such characters, they're so interesting. Uh, really fun to just sit and watch and they carry on and they're little cheeky buggers of things and they're just they're absolutely nuts but there's yeah a resident group that lives right around the accommodation there um and yeah they're just really really fun to to see and experience and just full of personality so yeah if there's any reason you want to go out to the pilgrim it's the apostle birds um so after after we sort of wrapped up having like a, a friendly sort of milkshake and chat with the people at the um, actual political pottery, we went for one of the bushwalks. There's quite a few bushwalks across the property. Um, and it was a pretty bad time of the day. It was late afternoon. It was pretty hot. So we weren't expecting to see much. And in reality, we didn't see much. We just got um, a lot of white skinks in the shade <laughs> um, and a, a couple of cryptoblepharus, uh, which you can get photos of. Unfortunately, and then um, a binos as well that um, bumped a rock and accidentally shot out from. So yeah, there's a um, it wasn't that that exciting herb wise, but the landscape and scenery was phenomenal. There's beautiful sort of geology and rock escarpments and things like that all through there. Um, and yeah, it's just a really well maintained property. So yeah, as I said, if you're ever out there, totally worth the check out. Um, so it was coming sort of towards the end of our trip. We didn't have too much left to do. We were heading off the next morning. Um, so I went for one more night out, hoping to try and get a few things. So one of the target species I personally really wanted to see, and I know that turned up in the area we were looking, uh, albeit not super common. Um, and we're going to try a few other places, but having heard stories about, um, uh, there's a, a nature reserve around there that um, I suppose they do turn up in the target species, being pale head snakes. Um, however, a lot of the, the locals out there and the, the caretakers aren't, aren't friendly to herpers um, just because they, I believe there has been issues in the past with like illegal taking of reptiles and things like that. So they're, they're not particularly friendly towards you and they, they really grill you. So we didn't want to cause any trouble and didn't go looking through there. But we, we did sort of have a look at surrounding areas just to see what we could see, hoping we would come across uh, a pale head snake. Um, but yeah, so we didn't, unfortunately, but we did come across a few other things, uh, one of which was a new one for the trip. I've seen them before, but it was the first time we got it on this trip, uh, Dubia Satella, Sigara Dubia. 
uh, which are always a fun little species. I think they're quite impressive little things. Um, I know there's a few gyro nerds out there, so hopefully you like them. Um, and then, yeah, plenty of nodidin. Um, and the reason I showed another photo of nodidin was this one had a bit of a story to it. So the place we were looking around for animals and sort of cruising around, there was actually a, another herper out that night who was also um, looking around. Um, and they, as I understand it, had been to the region quite a lot and seen pretty much everything out there. Um, but we're always keen to stop if something interesting happened. And we pulled over to photograph this noted and because it was sort of on the side of the road and we're like, oh, cool, you know, have a bit of fun, take a photo of a noted and kill some time. Um, and so we pulled over to take a photo and they'd seen us pulled over and we're thinking, well, if these guys have pulled over, they might have found something good. So they came over to see what we'd found. So there's two carloads of people there. And then this third car pulled up and stuff right next to us. Um, and we're like, oh, what's this third car? Like, you know, that's a bit strange. Like, what's what's this guy? We knew the other person was a herper, but we're like, oh, is it a third herper that's out here? Um, and anyway, it was just some local who'd come out and he was like, oh, we've lost our dog. And supposedly someone in this suburb said that they uh, found our dog and put it on Facebook. And uh, we had no clue. He was asking some directions to sort of the other areas and we were just like, oh, we can't help you. And then sort of clicked in his brain. He's like, wait, why are you guys all standing on the side of the road? And we were like, oh, well, we just saw this frog and wanted to get a photo. And I guess it was one of those things that the guy had implied he'd lived in the area for quite a long time, at least the greater Narrabri area. Um, and he was like, I'll be damned. I've never seen a frog like that. And went on to being like, isn't that one of the just prettiest things he'd ever seen? And um, it was a, I think he dropped the line, something along the lines of, I should say, you guys are just a regular bunch of David Attenboroughs. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of an entertaining experience. Again, like the, the Brown Rock Skinks highlighting that so many people who aren't looking for animals just don't realize where they are or what they come across a whole bunch of the time just because they're, they're not aware of them. But I always I was just find that an interesting thing personally. But yeah, so we made his night with that. He thought it was just such a, a brilliant little thing and took a few photos on his phone as well. Um, and then went on his way looking for his dog. Um, and then, yeah, other than that, we didn't really get any new species that night, unfortunately. So, um, again, in that general area, grey snakes turn up, uh, which would have been cool to see. Um, Delma, we were hoping for a pygopus, like a Schroeder eye, didn't get any of those, unfortunately. Uh, but we did get a species that I personally haven't seen in a very long time, but it was very happy to see, and that was a curl snake, the old Suda Suda. Um, so, we actually thought it was, as we drove past it initially, we thought it was a um another red nape and we're just gonna zip past and i was like no let's check it out see what it is and it turned out it was a curl snake which was fun they're always a cool species and as i said i hadn't seen one in a couple of years now so i was really stoked to see one of these guys again um i just i, I find a lot of the small life is quite charismatic personally probably said charismatic like eight times now but anyway i quite like them um so this is just my my trashy little photo of it looking straight down the camera and then uh, my friend Luke also got this photo here of um, it, which is a bit nice and got quite a, quite a bit better lighting, I think. Um, so yeah, so that sort of rounded out the night for us. We all had to go back to our um, respective homes. So Luke was going back up to Queensland and then we were going back to Sydney. Um, so we sort of called it a night there and I think it was probably about 11 o'clock. Um, went back to the accommodation and then had a rest so that we could head home to try and get home by sort of, you know, late afternoon uh, on the Monday of the long weekend. Um, so as we were sort of heading on the road, nothing really eventful happened, but we decided as we're going through Singleton, we're like, oh, vary it up, let's take the putty road home, you know, it'll be a bit more interesting. So we decided to go down the putty road. It was a good decision in hindsight because we got a um, gem of a find on the way back and it was actually a really reassuring thing. So for anyone that's driven on the putty road, they'll know it's a small windy road at parts. Um, and it definitely was where we found this Rosenberg's monitor. And unfortunately this guy had, uh, we actually think, thought it had been clipped and it was stuffed because um, it was sort of flopping around the road. It was an incredibly hot day. It was probably 35 plus. This guy was just sitting on the road during peak sort of long weekend, returning home traffic. Um, and he's so lucky that he wasn't by all intents and purposes clipped. Um, but yeah, we um, sort of, shuffled him off the road um because there was probably like in the time that we pulled over to try and get him off there would have been like 15 20 cars that were thankfully swerving to avoid hitting him um but yeah moved him off and got him into some shade and what i think may have happened 
was that he um, probably did get clipped at one point or bumped or something. And he does have some blood in his jaw, but we weren't sure if that was because um, he may have um, actually been feeding on something or whatever like that. Um, but yeah, we were actually thinking, we were even wondering if we should get into a, a reptile specialist better or a wildlife better or a carer or something, just because he didn't seem right. But yeah, after he'd been in the shade for about five minutes, he really perked up and sort of became a lot more um, attentive. So I don't know if he just got clipped and started overheating on the road or what had gone on. Um, but yeah, he, he perked up and, you know, got a snap of him and he shot off into the bush back to doing whatever Rosenberg's monitors do. But um, yeah, they're wonderful lizards, these guys. Um, so it made a, a nice a nice sort of thing because we were hoping as well to see some goulds in the Warren Bungles and I've seen goulds just west of Narrabri as well and uh, yeah unfortunately we didn't get any goulds out there so this guy was a pretty good consolation for it um, so yeah um, and that's pretty much wrapping up this trip I have done a bit of a, a cheaty um, uh, just for the frog people that may be watching so Narrabri is like a brilliant frog spot so not just um, for Notogen, Notogen are just definitely there, um, quite common in the right spots. Um, but the diversity mm -hmm. of frogs out there is just wonderful, especially as you go further west as well, you get some really cool stuff. Um, but you get plenty of the Cyclorana, so it's bloody stuff there, I believe it is. Uh, and then ornate burrowing frogs as well. And this was a trip I did just after the floods they had at Narrabri, um, I think February 2019, whenever the, the fires broke and there was flooding everywhere. But um, it was perfect for frogs. Not perfect for two-wheel drive cars that weren't great on um, soaked roads, but very perfect for frogs everywhere. Um, but so yeah, we had the pleasure of seeing these guys, ornate burrowing frogs out there, a dime a dozen, while they're not particularly common in Sydney from my experience. Um, salmon eyes, this was a nice big adult salmon eye. Then the dynasty salmon eye we found on the left. Um, Terigenae, so the, the northern Pobblebonk or scarlet sided Pobblebonk, which is a, a cool species to see. Um, and then also plenty of frogs mating or um, forming bubble nests. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's crazy how things change. So this trip we did out there before, um, the most common frog we saw was um, uh, Neobactrachus uh, sudeli, so sudel's frog or trilling frog. Um, and they were everywhere. You couldn't couldn't take a step without trying to avoid stepping on it. It was like a plague sort of thing. Um, and this time we didn't see a single one. Um, and yeah, I didn't see any of the water holding frogs out this time. Well, last time they were relatively common. They were uh, all, we saw pretty much all the species. I think there was one, one we missed. I can't remember, might've been Albu Gitata. I don't know if they're there, but there was one, one water holding frog species, stuck around species we missed out there, but we got the other ones out in that region. Um, but yeah, if you're a frog person, um, definitely head out there after a big rain event because you're, you're guaranteed to get some phenomenal species and just get to enjoy them. And yeah, that's, um, that's the end of my slideshow. So yeah, I hope you uh, enjoyed my travel log of sorts. Um, definitely, you know, we've got some good species, definitely plenty more. So hopefully for the next trip I'm um, planning to do out there, I would like to see you get um, Stechus guitatus. So hoping to see some of those out there. Still hoping for the pale heads, uh, which is the hoplocephalus. Uh, I can never say the last name, Bicordes or something. I can't, I can't do it. Um, but yeah, so plenty for next time. Gray snakes, hope to get them too. Um, as well as, yeah, I go for some Delma. So won't be my last trip out there. I'm sure it won't be the last trip for quite a few people. Um, but yeah, just as a final thing, thank you to people that gave us locations. So there were people that helped us find good spots to go look for things. Very thankful for your assistance. Um, thank you to the people that came along, uh, the friends that were there. So Luke, Mark, and John. Um, and yeah, keep hoping guys, enjoy it. Um, and yeah, if you're ever looking for a good spot, go to Narrabri.